how do you blow up your music? That's the question that artists are always asking us. But the thing is, the marketplace is always changing. Trends are always changing, especially year to year. So in this video, we're going to break down how do you blow up your music this year? But actually, more specifically, we're going to talk about how do you go global with your music this year? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. All right, all right. So we got to talk about blowing up your music globally, right, around the world instead of just your local market this year. And there's reasons for it because people, again, always ask us how do they blow up their music, right? Cool. But I think people need to understand the argument for why they should focus on going global first. Yeah, please tell them, Sean. There's a couple reasons. Number one, it's easier to go global than ever. In many cases, it's cheaper cheaper to go global. And three, if you focus on the right platforms, you can go global and local at the same time. But when you focus so much on going local, you actually miss global opportunities. So I want to touch on multiple things. One, we're going to talk about the ad side of what global go, going global looks like. We're going to talk about the influencer side of going global. And then we're also going to talk about on the organic content that you post on, on your page, artist generated content. What does that look like if you want to go global strategically? All right. The PR, what does that look like if you want to go global strategically this year? And then we're going to sprinkle in a little case studies throughout this situation. All right. Now, Let's start, I think, with influencers. Because influencers, I think, are one of the most direct ways people can think of going global. Yeah. What do I mean by that? Oh, this person's Australian and they're in Australia. This person's in the Philippines. This person's in Russia or whatever, right? So there's a direct line to it. But this case study I think clearly shows why going global is important. And we're going to start with JIT and then we're going to get into all the other ways and strategies that you can focus on going global. So influencers slash user generated content, the part that you can't control as much because I user generated content is just influencer content that you didn't pay for. That's the way I see it today. Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only difference because we will pay somebody who only has 10 followers if we see a need for it right so like influencer what really is an influencer what is a regular user did they get paid or not jid had the song surround sound that was out for two years right they're not pushing because they don't have any reason to at this point it did what it did we've moved on you know how artists are y'all focus on something else especially if you had that level of success you ain't thinking about pushing the song two years ago but you had this one guy in the philippines that wanted to create a viral song for whatever reason he chose that uh, a viral trend. He was focused on creating a viral trend, right? And doing something cool. But why did he choose surround song? I guess he had heard it before. Ooh, that actually takes me back to something else, a side value in his conversation. Um, and he did it. He actually did a little study, got the concept from a videographer or a photographer or somebody like that. All right, and then applied it to the campaign, like with his own creativity. That was not the campaign, the song with his own creativity. Posted a really dope video. That video took off. All right, he's in the Philippines, and I think he did it with like his classmates or something like that. But guess what? Not only did it take off in the Philippines, next thing you know, the people in America become aware of this trend. And then we translate this into American language, i.e. twerking. <laughs> and then it takes off in our language as well. You can never imagine people twerking to that song. You're right. You're right. I know in a million years, I see it has been thrown But where this there's home. a will, there's a way, baby. Where there is a will, there is a way. They, look, they want to do it to everything, but... They just don't know how they couldn't figure it out. I was like double dutch. How can I twerk to this shit right here? And then they finally saw. All right, there, there it is. Right. That that happened. Like, but you clearly saw how something can be global and then impact local. And that song took off. I, I should have asked uh, Zeke when I talked to him last how um like streaming, how much that impacted. But I feel like he alluded to it was a lot. I mean, we know it's a lot for sure, but like. I want to know the specific number. Um, with that being said, 
a quick little side thing. And we experienced this earlier on. This is the impact of getting your music out there. This is the impact of um, targeting and getting some, certain, getting your name in certain people's uh, mouths and being on the, the radar. That guy, that rando, respectfully, out in, <laughs> in the Philippines, only was able to choose Jid Surround Sound because he was already aware of that song. Like, he did something random that was great, but he had to be aware of it first. And that's the impact of when you start getting your catalog and your name out there. Now people know it. And in that situation, they chose that song. What we saw uh, early on, this is where I first made this observation on TikTok. I remember when we got Charlie D'Amelio to, um, she posted to this girl's new song. The song literally had just came out, right? This influencer campaign we were working. It was one of our first ones. And it was like, well, how did Charlie even know? Because it barely has any views. We barely like had anybody post to it yet. It was very clear that she had seen the last song that we got popping with her because we took that song viral. So now she was on her radar. That simple. And next thing you know, you had Charlie. Now, Charlie wasn't Charlie, Charlie, but she was still clearly on her way to being Charlie. And I think probably all already on the, uh, number one on the platform. But that comes from. Once somebody, once you're in somebody's universe, you never know when they might do something that might benefit to you. Yeah, and you never know who is a fan. You know, we talk about this all the time. You might have a video with a thousand views, and you don't know who contributed to that a thousand views. Yep, exactly. Hey, just want to drop this quick mention. If you're looking for help in blowing up your music and your career as a whole this year, at the beginning of every year, we open up to find new artists that we want to work with and continue to grow throughout the year which has resulted in many of the big moments that you hear us talk about. So if this time we've opened up where you'll be able to see how we approach things from ground zero, digging into your brand identity, translating that into content, advertising, and full-blown campaigns that result in streams and real fans. And it's only $1 at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash 30 days. I'll put a link in the description below. But beyond that process, we actually have ways to speak, get to know you, watch you grow throughout your process. So we can lean in and offer extra advising on how to navigate what you're going through in real time. So if you want some real help without having to sign your life away, check it out at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash 30 days. Either way it goes, best of luck to you and your career. All right, Sean. So I can assume naturally that the next question of the listener is how do I find these influencers you know I'm in LA you know I'm in Atlanta I'm in Doofenshmirtz Wisconsin how do I find these influencers how do I find influencers in the Philippines and so one method that we have done very simple but go find other artists that are popping in these countries and go to a TikTok go to an Instagram and look at the influencers using their sounds. Because I can assume that if I find this J-pop band, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and it's moving and it's got some numbers, then I can assume that there's going to be Japanese influencers making videos to the songs. And now I can use that artist's catalog as a directory, right? And the great thing about influencers is that, the, um, to your point earlier within the Charlie D'Amelio situation, the more of them that you connect with, the more of them that you start to become aware of, either because your algorithm going to start feeding them to you or because that influencer, the influencer that you connect with, will point you in the direction of more people and be like, hey, if, if I'm making a bag and I see that I can get my homie a bag, hey, my homie over there got 400,000 followers. He's also out here in Japan. Go talk to him. Here goes his email, you know. Because influencers love helping each other make money when they actually like each other. Uh, so that is in our, uh, well, I will at least say my personal opinion has been one of the easiest methods that we've used to find influencers. I don't know if you got anything else that you want to add to that. Instagram, I went into the platform and typed in country and music style. So like Filipino music or Korean music or German music or something. And then, you know, you'll start finding these platforms that are posting these types of artists German rap platforms just like there are US rap platforms there's Korean platforms just like there's you know Afrobeats platforms and you can sometimes see the people that they're following and interacting with and use that as a jump start too hey this German rap music page follows this guy that has 200,000 followers and he seems to be German and in Germany then I'm gonna reach out to bro and like you said Use him as my catalyst and use him to help me find other people. Um, you can find agencies as well that connect because when you, especially like 
when you're, let's just say from the U.S. looking out, agency, agencies in the United States are stupid expensive, all right, the prices that they charge you, but it can still relatively be cheap when you reach out to some of these agencies in Brazil and some of the other countries uh, relative to our dollar. I can't speak from every country and how they look at some of these countries, but I've had some situations I'm like, ooh, like, all right, this actually helps because it's hard to reach out to a lot of people that I don't speak the language fluently with anyway. So the agency really perfectly packages that for me and y'all are actually are affordable. So it makes just more, it, it makes a lot more sense that way. And I do also like that you touched on like using, like using, let's just say looking up Filipino music or something like that on Instagram. Cause whether or not that actually impacts, how do I say this? Whether or not the artist is big in the country that you're looking for, there's also this other element of, which is just the diaspora that exists potentially in your country of people from that other country. And so you don't have to just target the country directly. Sometimes you can, you know, hit the diaspora that exists in your country um, in the pages and still speak in your language because then they would be in your language, but you're touching these other cultures and then use that as an entryway as well. And that kind of like bleeds into PR, um, by the way, like bringing up the pages like you did, Corey. So, you know, I do want to like just solidify that point because the first point was more so like influencers and user generated content in terms of how you expand. The second one is like PR pages. So, for instance, like in Germany, there's a page, I think it's called like I Used to Love Her or something like that. And that's like a play on of like Common had this song, I Used to Love Her, like this hip hop. Like it means hip hop basically. Um, but it's a German page and they post a lot of hip hop um, like there. So, you know, when people come probably from America, like I, there are so many managers and people I know of some sizable artists that follow that page. It's like, okay, there are pages that are almost like the plug in their foreign marketplace that all the, let's say American artists come through whenever they go there. And they want to promo and reach that market. So some of that stuff is already established from a PR standpoint, whether it's on social or blogs or something like that. Yeah, it makes me think of um when 6ix9ine started popping, right? A lot of people don't know that 6ix9ine got his start on a Russian platform. Oh, yeah, F them. F them, yep. FCK them, yep. Yeah, they were basically like the four shooters of their time, but for Russia, right? And you know what I'm saying? One good take on that channel and some good marketing and he was up over there. And then we start to see that translated over here. And see your point, man, this is this is what I've seen. It's primarily a US artist issue. <laughs> US artists tend to not be aware that other countries also have music platforms. International artists seem to be more aware, right? Like they tend to speak more globally. It's typical American ignorance, man. Yeah, yeah, we, just, like, we just know what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, like I just got done helping um, there was an artist in our gold member program that was in London and she also wanted to build in London um, because she was there, but she also wanted to build in France. And I didn't know this, but France is like a couple of hour train ride away. So she's like, I can get there pretty easy. Let me build there. And within a weekend, we were able to find like 15 different music blog pages that were all French focused, right? So she started to run a campaign on those platforms, you know, and doing what we talked about, taking different headlines around the videos, putting them on the pages and, um, there was one post she made um, and the fans started saying that she looked like some popular French actress. And we had never heard of that actress, but I was like, hey, they think you look like her and that resonates. You should use that in your next post. So then the very next post was like, yo, who knew that? Whatever the actress name is, started rapping. And that shit hit because, you know, people from the post in France really thought that she was that French actress and it went from there. So, but my bigger point is that, um, there are a lot more of these platforms in other markets than you may be aware of. And to Sean's point, what is beautiful about them outside of just the access that they give you to that market is the price. Like I can't even lie about that. Like we're talking about like, I don't want to give away any platforms prices, you know, but it's not uncommon to hit a popping US platform and the minimum might be like a thousand, you know, for like a promo post, you know, like that's not uncommon when you start to talk about a lot of the top tier platforms. You can sometimes find platforms in other countries that'll be the exact same size and be like a 10th of the price. You know what I'm saying? Like I just used the Instagram page that's in Brazil the other day that had like 300,000 followers and bro only charged me like $70 USD. And I don't know what that translates to in Brazilian money, but, but you know, 
I was like, yeah. like I was like, oh, like that's all you want? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was prepared to at least give you like four five. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If that's what you wanted, but uh, seventy dollars, yeah, let's do it. And that goes back to Sean's earlier point about why sometimes the strategy is so important outside of, you know, extending the audience from where you live and outside of just taking advantage of a new market. Sometimes it really just boils down to bang for buck. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And before we get into the last two, we might focus a little bit on the third one, but last two strategies when it comes to going global, whether that's the content that you create personally and put on your own page or um, advertising, I want to speak on another case study that kind of pulls a lot of this together, which was Russ, right? He pulls the first half of it together. So you talked about his last marketing campaign. Before we get to that marketing campaign, I want to remind people, which we can speak on, his artist-generated content, he would be posting his music videos over and over again on Spotify. I'm on Spotify, good Lord. It was YouTube back in the day before he got on SoundCloud, all right? That was when I first discovered him. He was just a bunch of videos. And I happened to meet him. The only reason I actually checked him out, because I met him at this show. Um, and I thought he was dope. And I was doing a couple, like, interviews at the time. It was like this random series I was trying out, just literally for fun. Um, not I wasn't even in the music industry. It was just for fun. Uh, no, not even close to it, bro. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> I, bro, I used to be doing stuff, bro. Like I was a video editor and she's like, oh, it was a whole nother world. But um <laughs> so I just like, yeah, man, I thought you were dope. Would love to like do a little interview or something or whatever. And he was like, Oh man, you appreciate it. I'm about to go to Paris. And I was like, Paris? And again, he was just a random guy in the room. This was before he was Russ, Russ. Um, and you know, I was before I was <laughs> anything where near it. So for me, like I'm used to going to like college shows and stuff like that. I wasn't used to hearing the artist saying they're going like over there, like somewhere for real, for real. Like this sounds super legit. You know, at that age and time, like he could have been doing the worst stuff in Paris or like not doing nothing legit at all. And to me, just because he was going somewhere foreign, all right, it would have sounded like crazy. But later on, I heard him reference more about early. He would say early on, man, yeah, I, I hit overseas first. And I would go to shows and do shows and sound like he was actually getting paid and everything. Even if I think about that little short conversation that we had, um, like, so him, his artist generated content in this case, it was just his music back then is of course it'll look a little different, but his music and music videos that he was doing back then, like allowed him to go global first. Right. And then he capitalized on that and continued to run that up until eventually he hit in, in America and another instance that I never would have been aware of if it wasn't for some other client. I don't even think this guy became an official client. I think I just I know, like advised him a little bit. But apparently, in the you know, Russ is racially ambiguous. Like you don't necessarily think he's black, right? Like, but you know, you can even kind of try to skew that. Does he have some black in him? Not necessarily, but there he's racially ambiguous across some other sets of races, right? And apparently there was some country, I think that was in the Middle East area, if I remember correctly, either that or Africa, but I'm pretty sure it was Middle East. And um, they thought Russ was from there, right? Because of how Russ looks. They just kind of made the assumption or something like that. And maybe he referenced some chick and Russ leaned into that too, a little bit. Um, apparently that's what the guy said. He felt like, um, and, and I, don't, I can't remember if he was like hating it in the way he was saying it. Or just speaking in reality, but he was like, yeah, Russ is like obviously kind of leaning in or allowing people to think this way, right? Was he or not? I don't know. But it even that's what I kind of thought about when you talked about the girl with people relating uh, her to an actress that she didn't even know. But then, oh, let's lean into it. Like Russ just being global or whatever um, might have had the same thing. If he probably realized people thought he... Uh, was from there and then well, shoot let, like, let them think what they think I'm never going to explicitly say yes or no but let that vibe be what it is for a period of time so all that to say when things begin to happen globally like you'll find your in as long as you start the exposure portion of things so that's why I want to talk about that but I know you got all this 
this great info on his uh, rollout and, it, you know, anything else. Well, even before I get into that, because uh, you brought up a couple good points that we probably should have touched on at the top of the pod, but some of the benefits of the international marketing from like an extrinsic standpoint and other than just, you know, you possibly getting a 10, 10 times return on investment in terms of your viewership, but it's literally the mentality around you, right? It's different in other markets. Um, I've seen this with artist friends before. I've seen this with clients where as soon as they start getting their first couple of fans in another market, they be all over them. Yo, when you coming to Brazil, right? Like, how can we get you to Brazil? Their perception of you is vastly different than the way the people in your home market might view you. And what I always tell artists is that the reason behind this is it's easier to sell an image to someone that's far away than it is to sell an image to someone that is right down the street from you. It's like if I'm rapper A and I want the world to believe that I'm rich, you know, because that's a common trope within rap. I want everybody to believe that I'm that guy. I already got it. I don't need this music shit. Who going to believe that first? The, the kid in Brazil that just saw you for the first time on a YouTube video? Or the person that's in Atlanta that sees you pulling up to the Chevron in your Toyota? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a it's a difference. And I don't really say that, you know, and mean that in a bad way. But it's like, but it is a lot easier to get someone to buy into you when it is a lot harder for them to access you. Because they don't get all the answers to everything that they think about. Like, if you just kind of like the LaRush situation, he just leaves them wondering and lets their mind go wherever it goes. And a lot of times it goes in a particular direction that's beneficial to you. It's a lot. It's actually the closest you can get today to that allure that artists used to be able to accomplish. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And then and the things that are that would typically be boring about some of your stuff to someone in your market becomes exciting to these people. And I'll give you an example. If I see an Atlanta artist put a video out that they shot in Atlanta, I'm like, oh, that nigga downtown, right? Like he right by the 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 Waffle House. Exactly. I know exactly what street he on. It don't hit the same for me because I drive down a lot of those same streets every day. But somebody in South Africa, to them it's just like a cool city somewhere in the US. It's just a cool spot and they're like, oh, that's what Atlanta looks like? Oh yeah, that's cool. So like even things about you that you might think are boring or maybe that people in your home market are like, that don't work. You know, like don't shoot in front of that bridge. Everybody shoots in front of that bridge. But then it becomes like, well, what if I hit people that don't know about the bridge? They're not going to know that everybody's shot here. They don't know that every rapper in the city comes to this bridge to shoot their music video. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you can even kind of mold it a lot a lot differently. And, like, you know, in reality, man, for, like, 80% of artists, a lot of your first opportunities are going to come from people outside of your home market. Like, that's just the reality. A lot of your first fans are going to be people that don't live nowhere near you. A lot of your first paid opportunities are going to be through people that don't live anywhere near you. You know what I'm saying? But then that goes back to the first point I made about the perception of you. And um, yeah, you just said that real quickly and I ain't wanted to get brushed over because I think that's a very important reason for the why. And rest of the situation also ties into another point that we've been saying for years. And that's that blowing up internationally while making it seem like you're blowing up domestically is one of the biggest dark secrets of the music industry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there are so many artists where you will look and be like, damn, this motherfucker moving. He got 10 million streams in a week. But what he's not telling you is that 9.9 .9 million of that came from Germany and Russia, bro. And to be fair, why would he tell All you that? All that matters is, are they real? If they're real, beautiful. Don't just get caught up in like no fake stream box or something like that. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, man, because it's like it became very popular trope in rap. To like, oh, she got is she a foreign or exotic, right? That type of thing. And, you know, there's a lot of dudes who are into that, but I'm not into the idea of exotic for the sake of exotic, but I know that's like a thing, right? And exotic is relative. You go to a different country, the exotic chick looks different. The exotic guy looks different, right? Because it's what we used to. Exotic is literally just what we're not used to. That's all it is, right? And that speaks to the point of what you just said is like, oh, we're showing something that one side is familiar with, but the familiar here is different mm -hmm. there. So uh, use, it. look, if you feel like you're boring, use your boring to your advantage. And the only way you can do that is show somebody who ain't seen it before. <laughs> 
like, like, you know, it's like taking a girl on a date, bro. You know, like you probably take her to that one spot all the time. She gonna get sick of it. It don't matter how good the food is. It don't matter how nice the ambiance is. You know, you don't took it there 20 times. But you take your, you know what I'm saying, your, your little, yeah, I mean there to the same spot. You know, she gonna be excited, bro. That's just how the game go. <laughs> right, or you could take your girl to the, you could be, very, you could be predictable for a few months just to strategically, you know, surprise and spice spice things up. What I like to do, oh, oh my <laughs> well, what I like to do is take it to the same restaurant and just sit on a different side. So I'm like, hey baby, last time we was in the restaurant, we was on the left side near the bar. This time we in the back by the fire pit, it's different. It changes the experience, it's a whole different vibe, you know what I mean? When you get people walking by us last time, we couldn't people watch. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, I'll let that argument be between y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest situation, the rest case study, um. I was saying that the last big marketing push that I noticed from him, where it seems like he was actively pushing a message, was around um, that international tour that he was doing and that uh, that situation that he did in Egypt, where he was like the first person to like perform at like a pyramid or something, something like that. And um, what was interesting is that, I mean, that's a narrative in itself that's strong, that's not US focused, but he did push it in the US and people in Egypt were probably like, you know, motherfuckers perform here all the time. But people in the U.S. are going to be like, damn, that's five. Russ is performing in Egypt. And he's the first person to do X, Y, Z in Egypt. You know what I'm saying? And that goes back to something that you said. You can take the same story. You know, it'd be not interesting here and be really interesting here. It could be not interesting there and be really interesting over here. Um, but the international focus was the focus of it. And I think that, you know, if you look at a lot of Russ's stuff, his early career was him, you know, despite the things that we talked about, was bragging about how much he was, you know, dominating the U.S. market with the with the music, right? So I think even for him, and I could be wrong, but but I think that now he does want to highlight how much more global he is and that people may even think. All that I really get to. Yeah, because I mean, there might be people out there who are like, bro, I mean, I've seen the comments online. The only people that listen to Russ is 16-year-old white girls. And then here go Russ showing you a crowd of grown Egyptians jumping up and down to his music. <laughs> you know what I mean? He shut all that shit up, you know? So, but I, I think it's interesting that, um, like you said, I, I do think it's one of the deep, dark secrets of the industry. You know, how can we pop this artist off over here, but then make it look like they're popping off over here? You know, can we put them in the right places? Because, you know, the average consumer isn't about to go log into Spotify and look in the back end and, you know, see where shit came from. They're not doing that. But they're going to see, hey, you got 10 million streams in a week, and I know about you in the U.S., I'm going to assume that majority of that 10 million came from here. The music industry on all sides is built off of perception-based leverage, yeah, right? And how can I flip this perception of leverage into real leverage and then use the un undo perception based on the minute leverage to get some more leverage? <laughs> like this is, it's just doing that over and over again. Now, because we got to do this interview, I don't want to uh, spend too much more time. We got... Last two points, artist-generated content. We touched on that with Russ, right? He posts on YouTube. He's blowing up somewhere else. The only thing point I want to make, right, when it comes to artist-generated content, that means you post it yourself. Well, how can you make sure it's worldwide, right? It's not like you can target it like with, you can with ads or look for influencers in those countries and stuff like you can with influencers. Well, it's more about the platforms. When you are on YouTube or TikTok, those platforms more naturally Go global, yeah, right. organically. TikTok especially. You have no idea who's following you or where they're from. That's that that globalization. Those walls being like knocked down is actually a part of the platform. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But um, and it's something to think about. But um, it comes down to access, and and so one thing I do think is important to think about when doing international marketing or not even think about, but to do is a lot of research. Um, Cause there are cultural nuances that come into play. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially when you're scaling it. But, um, and even just thinking about it, right? Cause to your point, TikTok and YouTube are two of the biggest platforms internationally. Why? Because they're two of the most accessible platforms. And that's to everybody, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like everybody can't get Facebook. Everybody can't get Instagram, but you know, majority of the world got access to YouTube. So it's like, do you want a better chance of hitting majority of the world? Then yeah, YouTube, Instagram. No, YouTube, TikTok are more than likely going to be great places for you to start. And then the last thing is ads. So ads, just say this. We have our worldwide ad strategy, the easy thing to do, right? You target worldwide, basically, 
or a set of countries. You don't have to literally just target worldwide, but you start. Uh, you could even just select a few different countries and then see which cities start to hit. And you use that to then figure out where you're going to double it down with ads, figure out where you're going to actually double down with influencers. Basically, figure out which countries are worth learning. Yeah. Unless you already got a reason, like we've had some artists that, oh, I know I want to target back home, like something like that. Which there's a play there. You know, I mean, it's like you said, you know, you put all this together. It's a it's a really easy international marketing strategy, at least to my marketing guru brain. Right. You set up your worldwide ads. You know, you let them run for a week or two. You see, you know, Brazil is over indexing for me. So I'm going to cut out all the other countries, scale my ads to only target Brazil, you know, and maximize there. Let that get going, you know, let it get hot. Maybe go pick up one or two other ad platforms and, you know, set them up to run to Brazil. You know, let them get hot. Then you go find your influencers, right? You start finding these people in these markets that can post your music while also finding the pages um, that can post your music that, that speaks to this audience. And then at that point, you're really just rinsing and repeating until you are, of course, able to make certain real world moves like going to that market for a show or like a, a brand opportunity or a collab and, you know, things like that. And like, you know, all that stuff put together is a or sounds like a pretty well put together marketing plan. But in reality, it is a very powerful and effective marketing strategy for growing someone in an international market. And we know this because this is literally our strategy and we do this all the time. That is a fact. <laughs> I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.